Welcome to another episode of Extreme Metal Television. I'm your host, Simon. In this episode, we have a chat with Kill Devil Hill, Striker, and Anvil. But first, let's kick it off with a band profile. Titan's Eve was formed in 2008 in Vancouver, British Columbia. They released three albums, 2009's Into the Fire EP, 2010's Divine Equal, and their brand new CD, Life Apocalypse. Well, the new album is, uh, is a concept album, uh, loosely based, uh, but it's, it's essentially what it's about is about overcoming trials in your life, you know, trials and tribulations in your life, and, uh, you know, everybody has their own personal and life experience for themselves, you know, other than the whole Mayan calendar and all that, right? So that's what the album centers on, is, is that and that, that feeling, and then overcoming it. Uh, this is concept album number two, I guess, really. Yep. Like, do you, do you really like working within a theme? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's like, you know, the last was kind of like a mythology and re relating that mythology to, you know, people's lives once again. But, yeah. you know, this is now taking um, actual, real-time, you know, feelings and stuff and trying to kind of like, con you know, get people connected with that. So, yeah, you know, I like working with yeah. themes. You know? And when we started writing, we didn't really want to do a theme. But then uh, we were just so like, well, life was really shitty for us at the time. So I was like, God, I was like, everything sucks. And we're both so pissed off. Let's write an album that's like Life Apocalypse. Yeah, that works. So that was kind of how that whole thing got started. How does Life Apocalypse differ from the Divine Equal stylistically? Um, I, I think it's way more aggressive. It's, yeah. it's a way more aggressive record. Um, you know, where we we uh, wanted to make it like a lot more dark, right? The, the Divine Equal was much more, I guess you could say, triumphant in a yeah. way, right? They had that feeling for it, you know, revenge and taking on the world, that kind of thing. So this is about just being angry and getting through it and powering on. For another new album is quite striking. Can you tell us uh, uh, about the artist and the oh, idea yeah. behind it? Sure. Yeah. Um, we were trying to get Megadeth's artist, yeah. and we couldn't get him. And then we tried uh, some other people. And then I found this German guy. His name's Bjorn Gusses. I think that's how you pronounce it. And he's worked with uh, Six Feet Under and stuff like that. And we loved what he does. Yeah. Like this ultra realistic art. So I contacted him, and he was down right from the bat. So we were stoked on that. And uh, the concept was just basically summing up all the lyrics in an image. And the image is a guy on the dock on the brink of doom. So it was good. It so was, was that the, the idea with the guy on the dock? Was that your idea? It was, or it was our idea. And we originally wanted the guy to be facing uh, away towards yeah. the tidal wave. But it, Bjorn put him facing the you know, album. And that was his idea. And, and he put in the coffins and stuff. Yeah. He added the nice little features, yeah. yeah. Hi, this is Barney from Napalm Dead, singer of some description, and you're watching Extreme Metal Television. Getting a chance to interview Anvil was a huge thrill for me. When I first saw the Metal on Metal video, it blew my mind. I taped it off and watched it over and over again. Now, it wasn't just that it was a great song. It was a great song by a Canadian metal band, and it taught me that, yes, Canadians can do this too. And that was a big moment for me. Now, speaking of the highly influential Metal on Metal album, this year marked its 30th anniversary. So we sat down with Anvil vocalist Lips and asked him during the recording process if they had any idea what the album would become. No, because you're innocent. You don't know what. Yeah. When you go and do something, you're not, you're not planning it to be anything other than what you want it to be. It's obviously we wanted it to be a great album. We didn't realize that it was going to change the face of whatever came after it. We had no clue. Yeah. How are you going to ever know that? Uh, I know. Uh, well, yeah, I guess. Uh, but, I mean, you guys were doing something different there, and it, and it, it inspired so many people. Like, what was your mindset going into the studio back in, like, 30 years ago, like, to do that album? Did, did it didn't, you, because it really, to us, it didn't seem that we were really, because we weren't really thinking in those terms. Yeah. You know, you're not thinking, well, we're doing something so different. 
You don't want to be doing something that different. You'd be probably intimidated by that. And you put out the 13 albums, 13 minutes. You went about selling it yourselves, which is a model that a lot of younger bands and well, even some established bands are going with now. And that was kind of groundbreaking at the time to sell it directly to your fans. Would you go that route again now that I think a lot well, well, are well, what, what happened was we, because of the explosive uh, result of the movie, it became impossible to keep up with the demands. Yeah. You're just not going to be able to cover it. Can't do it. And we're going to be missing out on, on people knowing our music. If we continue down that road, we had to get it commercially, commercially available. So it became a necessity. Yeah. Like I said, it's, you don't do things because <laughs> <laughs> you just feel like it. You, you do it because you have no other choice. Yeah. It became a necessity. We had to. Yeah. Well, I mean, it was a model that, well, uh, especially younger bands now really go with. And it's a good model, I think. Especially well, if you're, if you're if in you a new band. If you ask me, if you ask me, it's still a better way. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, I, I, it's, it's, it's a conundrum, man, because what you lose is finance, and what you gain is popularity. This past Canada Day, Anvil had the opportunity to play their first ever show in Taiwan in a huge Canada Day celebration. We asked the band what that experience was like. Well, it was a very, very special uh, situation. Um, Taiwan has a huge Canadian contingency, huge amount of Canadians living there. Yeah. And on Canada Day, they have a, the biggest uh, Canada Day celebration outside of Canada. And we were asked to play it. So that's how that came to be. Uh, that must have been quite an experience. This is your first time in Taiwan. It was our first time there. Yeah. Yeah. Incredible experience. Yeah. Uh, Not that much different from Japan, but an, yet another sort of, it's another Asian community. Um, just spectacular. The people were phenomenal. But I, I remember watching much music and seeing the metal on metal at the live video, and just being blown away. It was just like, all right, this is awesome. And these guys are Canadian. Just made me feel like, oh wow, fuck, well, Canadians that, can do this too. <laughs> well, yeah, Canadians can do that too, boy, in a big way. And in fact, I, uh, Canadians in a lot of a lot of ways are the most influential. Some of the most influential music has come out of this country, and um, there's no reason. For, uh, and for Canadians to be as humble as they are, we just are. Yeah. I mean, that's that's part of the part of the, the conundrum here. Yeah. Um, we don't believe in our own talent until it's made it everywhere else. This is Glenn Benton of DSI. You're watching Extreme Metal Television. Yeah. Edmonton, Alberta Striker has been rocking the local scene and touring internationally since 2007. They just released their newest album, Arm to the Teeth, on Napalm Records, and we asked the band about their new album. Well, our new album's uh, called Arm to the Teeth. It just came out in Europe on the uh, 27th. And it's out in uh, North America on the 6th, right? 6th? Uh, 7th, this Tuesday. 7th. The 7th, this Tuesday. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you recorded this one with uh, Iron to Teeth with a legendary producer, Michael Wagner. Yes. Uh, what was that experience like? Fuck, I, can I swear on this? It was, <laughs> <laughs> it was fucking awesome, man. He was. I don't know, we kind of didn't know what to expect going in, right? Like, we've, we haven't done anything. Last album we recorded in Dan's basement, and we mixed it in the studio, but, yeah. you know, going from that to multi-platinum, you know, almost 100 million album kind of producer was a, you know, a big switch for us, but 
it was he was super nice. I don't know, it was really yeah, comfortable. He was really for a guy who sold so much albums, so many albums, he's pretty like down to earth guy. Yeah. It was pretty awesome. Yeah, it's good sushi for lunch every day. <laughs> Went out. <and laughs> yeah. It's good. So I guess uh, and then what was the studio experience like for that? Like, it was super laid back. I mean, he yeah. kind of is like, the studio's just outside of Nashville, so it's like, uh, sort of like in the forest almost. There's like deer and shit running <laughs> yeah. around and stuff. So it was really like far away from everything. Like, it's not like a downtown studio or whatever. So it was really relaxed and we just had a lot of time to spend and like focus on the album. So what went into your choice? Like, what went into the decision to pick him as a producer besides the obvious? <laughs> Started as a shot in the dark. Yeah. To be honest, uh, <laughs> no fun Dan thought maybe. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, Dan brought up the idea of like let's write him and just see what he says, and I thought like, fuck off, this guy's not gonna want to work with us. And then yeah, called my bluff. Striker has a very traditional mix of power, speed, and thrash elements to their music. And we asked the band about how they develop their traditional sound. I think it's sort of by accident, really. Yeah. Like, it's just, I don't think we've ever set out to be like one style. I mean, when we yeah. started the band, we wanted to be like, uh, like Racer X or something yeah. like that. Like a super shred band. And I mean, it didn't. It, it turned up, out those guys were good at guitar. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so like we, we never ended up going that way, but like, uh, well, we sort of do that kind of shit. But like, um, I don't know, we kind of just write whatever, and if we like it, then that's what we do. You guys shot a video for uh, the Burn. Can you tell us a bit about that? Well, we uh, actually filmed with a guy, a uh, producer here in uh, Calgary, uh, Mike Peterson. Uh, he did uh, a movie, uh, Lloyd the Conqueror, okay, which yeah. uh, he wanted like a metal soundtrack for. And uh, so, some, somehow we got mixed up in that. And he, uh, we recorded a, a, a song in my basement, uh, Fight for Your Life, the original version. And, and there's a new version on the album. But um, he said after we gave him that, he, we kept in touch. And he said, you know, if you guys ever want a music video, just let me know and I mean maybe it was an empty gesture but I don't think so so it was, we, we took him, him out on we it. took him up on it and fuck and then he was like well you guys want to have like flamethrower guitars and like a beer chase scene and we're like uh yeah like the, I mean we, I don't think we could have even come up with anything like no I would we would have been like well we can do some performance footage yeah. or something yeah, I guess like, no like, fuck it man we'll have uh, we'll, you guys could shoot fuck gas flaming <laughs> gasoline at a moving car and shit like, we're like yeah sure man that sounds awesome that was a lot of fun We had the opportunity to sit down with two metal legends last month, Vinny Apice and Rex Brown of Kill Devil Hill. Their new album was released earlier this year. We asked them how the band came together. Well, yeah, I wanted to have, uh, I wanted to put a band together. I came yeah. off the Heaven and Hell tour, and then uh, always wanted to have a fucking great band, you know. Yeah. And uh, so, got off the tour and I had to get shoulder surgery, and I couldn't play. But right before that, I recorded a whole bunch of drum tracks for download, different tempos, different things. Uh, different uh, fields, so I had these tracks, but I couldn't play. So it was like, what do I do? You know, for six months I'm gonna sit here. So I got some people down, to start working on playing to the drum tracks, and it started sounding great. Yeah. And then I heard about Mark Zavon. He came down. I invited him down. We worked together, and it was really, really, really gelled well. It was easy to work with. And then he turned me on to Dewey and uh, played me some Dewey, some of the vocals that Dewey did, and I uh, said, that, that's the guy. Yeah. That sounds killer. So we worked together for a while, and then we were missing bass player. You know, Mark was putting bass down, so I thought, who's the biggest, baddest, baddest bass player on the planet? <laughs> he just saying that because I'm sitting here. <laughs> and I play with, he's a butler, and I play with this guy. <laughs> Monster players. Thanks. So we know each other from you know, playing many years ago, together, yeah. many years ago. And uh, I heard through the grapevine, Rex might be looking. So I called Rex and sent him the stuff and he loved it and played on it and that was the missing link. What was the recording process like for this album? The recording process, uh, 
Vinny got his drums done in three and a half days. <laughs> and my guitar was, uh, the bass was done in about six days, and we were using one record, and then uh, we had to use different guys to mix the record and all bit, so. Um, you know, it sounds frightening, you know, to me. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, that's awfully quick. Now you worked with uh, uh, Warren Riker on this album, right, as producer? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you tried to write it for us, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I don't know, what goes into your choice to pick a producer? I'm sorry. What goes into your choice to pick a producer? When you're picking a producer for the album, mm -hmm. like, what do you think? Well, he has to be on the same page. He has to uh, know how to get that intensity that and what we're hearing in our you, head yeah right and, and what you play on stage you know you, the, the intensity on stage and you know how to capture that on on the record and in the studio you know some guys you know you play hard especially drums and you listen it sounds like you're playing soft yeah so you got to capture that stuff so that's important you know? Vinny and Rex have been making music for a long time and both have had some incredible career highs. With all their experience, I wanted to know what they thought of the current state of the music industry. What music industry? Well, yeah, okay, yeah, fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> Is it a little worrisome or? Well, I think you gotta get out there these days and work. Yeah. You know, you can put your stuff on the internet and, and distribute it that way and try to get known that way, but all in all, bands and even big bands make them making the money to survive on the road, selling merch and gigs, not so much albums so much. Yeah, anymore. it's a lot. It's yeah. So you gotta get out there and play, you know? And the internet's a good tool to be in contact with everybody around the world and fans are building up fans and stuff. So you gotta kind of do both now, but it's drastically changed from when Back we in were our, doing stuff. You know, the heyday. I want to know what the meaning was behind the album artwork. Something cool came in, we liked it, and we were yeah. like, cool. You know what? Some guy, actually, he's from Canada. And, Rory. Uh, Rory. And he sent this in. I think he was friends of uh, Gloria Butler and Giza Butler. And he heard about the band. He didn't even hear the music, but he sent that to us. As soon as I saw it, I, I had a feeling that that was going to be it. And then we contacted other people, and we saw other you know, samples of artwork it for the It's so album. cool, it, it, you know, kind of what... And that one just music. stood out, and it seemed to, to fit the music. The guy had never even heard the music. Yeah. And it was just like the chair, the Bible, the skull, like, you don't know what's going to happen if you sit in a chair or yeah. whatever, and it's simple. So, so sometimes it's kind of like the lyrics, you take your own, you know, connotation yeah. of what it's going to mean and, yeah. you know, make the best of it. Well, that's it for another episode of Extreme Metal Television. I'd like to thank you all once again for joining us. I'd also like to thank my co-hosts King and Dr. Gore. If you'd like to send us a message, please feel free to email us at ExtremeMetalTV at gmail.com. Check out our Facebook page. But before I let you go, here's a terrible tale from the road from Barn Burner. The day we crossed back into Canada to go play some shows in Quebec, um, I think we crossed the border like after about like what 40 minutes or so and uh it's me and taylor sitting in the front seat taylor's drummer he's driving and he's just this loud like clunk and like the van shifts and and i'm thinking like oh fuck we got another flat tire and taylor's driving and he's looking in the rear mirror he's like oh fuck oh fuck oh fuck the wheel and like the fucking wheel just like barrels past us on the highway. The tire wheel whole thing, like we snapped off three bolts and lost all the lug nuts. I mean, probably our fault for not getting it checked out at a garage after we changed the tire, but I mean, it goes like a hundred feet, like down yeah. the highway into the ditch. Passes us, like, yeah. Yeah, that was a whole ordeal. And then of course, like, as soon as we get out of the van to go fetch the tire, like a torrential downpour yeah. starts. So we just get soaked and it's like, really? Like thunder and really? lightning? Really? Like, like, yeah. Just like. The most metal of all tire problems you can have on a van, I think. Yeah.